All right, what's up, my friends? How we doing? We've got 20 minutes, so I'm gonna roll. I'm Tom Murray. I'm the Director of Innovation and Future Ready Schools, and here's the thing. In 20 minutes, I'm gonna try and give you four key ways to stay personal and authentic in the midst of adversity. So as we roll, here's the thing. I will never stand in front of a group. I don't care if it's 10,000 people or 20 people. I don't care if I have six hours or I have 20 minutes without first saying thanks. Thanks for your work. Thanks for loving and caring about kids, the late nights, the early mornings. Thanks for what you do each and every day to change the lives of the people around us. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to pull out your cell phones. For those that you were texting the whole time, like Marlon, that was real, real easy. I want you to pull out your cell phones. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Can we throw the slides up there? I'm going to give you 30 seconds, if we could. In the next 30 seconds, what I want you to do is I want you to find the contacts in your phone. I want you to open up your contacts. And as I'm talking in the next few moments, I want you to multitask for the next 30 seconds. Look at your contacts. I want you to find somebody you love and care about, you haven't connected with in a long time, and you have 30 seconds to make their day. You haven't talked to them in five or six months, just send them a text message totally out of the blue. Love and care about you, how you doing, hope you're doing well. You have 30 seconds to do that. Multitask as I keep going just because we have a limited amount of time. So one of the things I want to dive into for a moment is this culture for learning. I want to spend some time in thinking about the work that we do as educators. So I want to ask you, what is it you intentionally do to build the culture where you work? What I didn't ask is what your superintendent does. What I didn't ask what your principals do or I didn't ask what your teachers do. I asked what you do. Because in our world, it's so easy, is it not, to point the finger? Well, if our superintendent would finally, if our board would actually, if our governor would finally, that's real, real easy in our world, isn't it? And it takes zero courage. You know, it's a challenge for me, looking in the mirror and asking the same question to myself. What about me? How do I impact that? You see, every interaction that we have is either a culture builder or a culture killer. I believe there's very few totally neutral interactions. One of my best friends in the world is a guy named Joe Sanfilippo, superintendent out of the year of Wisconsin. About four years ago, Joe and I were out to dinner having a conversation, and he made the statement of, Tom, I think culture in a school is built 30 seconds at a time. Here's what I can tell you. I vulnerably tell you when he said it, I laughed. I was like, come on, dude, 30 seconds at a time? It sounds great on Twitter, but 30 seconds at a time? I'm like, a best friend, what? He pushed back. He's like, Tom, how many of your interactions in a given day are 30 seconds or less? And I started to process being that teacher standing at the door as kids were coming in, being that teacher in that classroom having quick conversations. The phone rings. I walk down the office, quick conversation, quick conversation in the faculty room. Started to picture being that district level leader, that school level leader with all these quick conversations. I started to process, you know what? He's right. Every interaction really does matter. It's why I believe right now your school's culture perfectly aligns with the mindset and the actions of we adults in the building. You see, when you walk into that faculty room, you build the energy up, or do you suck the air right out of the room? Don't look at your colleague. It's not a good time. But you know what I'm talking about, right? When we think about this notion around culture, the first key that I want to give us is to stay personal and authentic in the midst of adversity. We have to hyper-focus on culture, especially at a time where fear and anxiety so much are permeating the inside of our walls from outside to hyper focus on culture. So what is it that you do to create an environment where people want to be? Because pointing the finger in our world is real easy. Looking in the mirror is a little bit more of a challenge. That's number one. Number two is I want to think a little bit about mindset in this work. We look at it as the glass half full, is the glass half empty, but here's another way to look at it, right? Is the glass also refillable? So what I want to do is I want to throw something on the screen. There's a little tiny screen over there. I want you to process for a moment. I want to walk you through something. I want to pretend you get back from this great conference. Your principal or your superintendent, your registrar, whoever it is, comes to you and says, hey, you're getting a new student. She's coming in from out of state. For whatever reason, we only have just the attendance data for this particular girl that's coming into your class or into your school. In the last 14 months, this child's been absent 35 times. In the last 14 months, this child's been tardy 20 times. And let's take the disclaimer, it has nothing to do with COVID. This is not COVID related. That would obviously be an obvious thought. I want you to process for a moment. I want you to be real and I want you to process. I'm going to ask for some answers here. In the last 14 months, she's been gone 35 times. She's been tardy 20 times. I need you to be totally real with me. What judgments might people start to make? It doesn't mean you would make the judgment. What judgments might people start to make? I want to make it interactive real quick. Throw some hands up. Give me some judgments people might make. Go. Bad student. Maybe she's academically low. Give me some more real quick. Doesn't care. Parents are disconnected. Somebody over there. Irresponsible parenting. Parent doesn't want to be there. I've heard drugs, bullying. Maybe she's pregnant. Anxiety. Doesn't want to be there. All those pieces. You see that data on the screen real quick? It's actually the data for my daughter. <laughs> By the way, parents are a mess. Thanks for the shout out. I appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I tell you just for a moment part of her story? Can I tell you what it was like when she was 10 months old? My wife and I had some friends over for dinner. They brought over hummus. 
We had no idea the severity of her food allergies that evening. They walked into the house. They brought it. We were sitting there. She's 10 months old. Happy-go-lucky kid. We're sitting there having dinner. And for some reason, somehow, she happened to get a little bit on her hand. We didn't feed it to her. She happened to get a little on her hand, and she went like this. Can I tell you what it was like as her daddy, watching my baby girl in a two-minute period go from happy-go-lucky to her head go back, her face become red, her lips start to turn blue, and <gasps> gasping for air. Can I tell you about that? It's a sound I'll never forget. Can I tell you what it was like taking my baby girl, grabbing her from her high chair, sprinting to the car, doing 100 miles an hour to the hospital, literally begging God to save my daughter because he couldn't breathe. She couldn't breathe. Can I tell you about that moment? Can I tell you what it was like watching the nurse run out and stab her in the leg with an EpiPen as I screamed for one running into the emergency room if I could tell you about that moment? So let me tell you a little bit more about the story. What if I told you in every one of those 35 absences, a baby girl was two hours from our house undergoing food allergy therapy as the first child in the Northeast to undergo it for sesame seeds, which she was allergic to? What if I would tell you in every one of those 35 absences, as we traveled in every one of those additional tardies, as we traveled 10,000 miles, she spent 180 in the car, 80 hours in the car. What if I told you during that time, every single time she would say, Mommy or Daddy, I really wish I could be in school today. You see, as a power of the story, as I tell you the story, it matters. You see, a key to building culture in our schools, we talk about staying personal and authentic, is to really understand and take a look for and seek out and have empathy for the hidden stories inside of other people. And here's the thing, I'm not just talking about our kids, I'm talking about you. It's the stories on our hearts, even today, the stories on our hearts, and hidden doesn't mean always bad, maybe it's a great thing. Maybe we can, you get home from this great conference, you have something with your spouse, you're super fired up, you can't wait, you're super excited. But if I'm totally real, maybe you're struggling today. Maybe here you are talking about all this work stuff and your marriage is falling apart and you're really struggling right here. You see, it's the, the part of our world that is challenging because sometimes we expect people to just show up, drop everything at the door, stop what they're doing, and be this perfect person for kids. But here's the reality. We're human beings. This hidden stories within matters because here's the piece. I tell you, the data, we go to conferences like this, lots of conversations around data. Data's important. It's a snapshot. I show you the data, we get one picture. But I tell you the story, now we have a better understanding. And I want to be really clear, data is important in our work, it absolutely is, but making decisions based on data without understanding the story, and we can make some really bad decisions for kids in the same sense if we're not careful. You see, do we choose to see the hidden stories in those around us or just our side of ourselves? As we process the students that walk into our classrooms, that walk into our schools, as we process that teacher across the hall or that principal down the hall, the story's on the heart of that superintendent leading that school district because it matters every single time. One of the things I wrote in Personal and Authentic is how the difference between making a judgment, which, by the way, your brain does naturally. Your brain is wired to make connections. Your brain's wired to make judgments. The difference between making a judgment and having empathy is understanding the story. So a question for you as we process this work is how do we get to know the stories of our people? I'll give, you a shout, I'll give a shout out to my daughter's sixth grade teacher this year. Early in the year, one of the very first writing assignments was, if you really knew me, you would know that. I had some tears flowing as my daughter showed me the final copy of her sixth grade first thing that she was handing in, and she told part of her story to her teacher. So in that first week of school, she had an understanding or an idea of part of the story on my daughter's heart. And when we process those pieces, do we create a culture of trust? Do we create an environment? Because I also believe it's a child's story that defines the context in which learning occurs. I'll give you some examples. Stories of racism, stories of abuse, stories of hope, stories of opportunity, stories of love, stories of opportunity because of people like you that created great environments where people want to be. So point number two, to stay personal and authentic in the midst of adversity, we have to lead with an empathy lens. So we process this a little bit further. Here's the next thing I want to do very quickly. I want you to process those people that you lead. Maybe it's students, Maybe your principal, maybe it's teachers, maybe your superintendent, maybe it's your entire district. I want you to process what do you expect from the people that you lead. Now, because of time, I got a little bit of time, I'm going to ask you to turn to somebody else next to you. I want to give you like 45 seconds. Just rattle off. What are some expectations? It's not a loaded question. What are some expectations you have for the people that you lead? You have 45 seconds. Go. Quick conversation. Say a quick hello if you don't know the person. Go.
30 seconds, 30 seconds. Quick conversation, 30 seconds. All right, 15 seconds, 15 seconds. All right, let me bring it back. Let me bring it back. I want to hear a couple of them. Give me, let's give you five or six. Somebody over here, give me a couple. Give me one or two of them of this group over here. What do you expect from the people you lead? It's not a, it's not a wide, it's a wide open question. It's not loaded. Somebody over here, give me, give me a couple of them. Go, you'll share hers. Go ahead. What is she? You have, she have permission to do that? Is that okay? All right, go ahead. Give me, give me an expectation. Keep students at the center, Keep students at the center of all decision making. Somebody else over there. Give me another one. Okay, bu building relationships. Give me a couple in this middle group. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Good. Absolutely great. And somebody else in here? Give me an expectation. Lucio, go ahead. Okay. Be somebody that invites you to lead with them. Ladies over there, give me one or two. What else do you have? Give me some expectations you have for the people you lead. Okay. Be open. Communicate. Can I be totally honest with you, my friends? I actually really don't care what you expect. I really don't. I care uh, what you model. Every one of you in this room, based on your roles, I'm making an assumption, but based on your roles, has the, I'm going to use the word fragilely, power to expect things from other people. Even if you're a teacher in that classroom, you have the quote-unquote power to expect a lot of things from our kids. As principals, your influence over that whole building, you are influencing the lives. I mean, let's be real. If you're a school administrator, give me a wave. Every school administrator in this room, you have the opportunity to make people's lives miserable in a given day. You really do. In an email, you really do. You see, how do you model this work? Because it's real easy to point the finger, isn't it? It's a lot more challenging. When I process this as an example on how we're modeling these expectations, I think about how many times it was me leading that faculty meeting, 60 straight minutes of standing deliver, and then talking to my teachers about you can't just stand and deliver. Just process that. How do we model the expectations? Let me tell you about a time that I really messed this up. You see, working with the U.S. Senate and the Congress a couple of years ago, it was pre-COVID, I was working with the U.S. Senate Health Committee around trauma-informed and SEL, and I was trying to get the U.S. Senate some examples of districts across the country, and I'm waiting for this email. I fly home. It was this one particular week, and that year I flew 165 times. You do the math pretty much every other day. And so I, was, I fly home this one particular day. It's the only day I'm home that week. I kiss my Paisley and Caden on the head. My babies say hi to them. I say hello to my wife. She starts to cook dinner. It's about 5.15, and I'm waiting for this email, and I haven't gotten it yet. About 5.30, she's like, all right, guys, dinner time. We go rolling over. My son, Caden, was six at the time. He's rolling over to the dinner table holding his iPad like this. And I'm like, Caden, bud, come on. Go put your iPad away. Honey, go put your iPad away. It's dinner time. We sit down. We say grace. We're starting to have some conversations. And about 10 minutes into dinner, I realize it's like 5.45. I haven't gotten this, I haven't gotten this email yet, so I'm just being totally real. I do one of these, like, all right, there we go. Perfect. That's senate.gov.us. My wife kicked me so ridiculously hard under the dinner table. I'm like, she's like, true story, my six-year-old's like, <laughs> how hypocritical of this guy right here to tell my son no devices at the dinner table literally 10 minutes later I'm staring at my phone. And I wonder how many times that was me as the teacher. <laughs> Don't bring the cell phone into the classroom. And I'm standing up there, hey, honey, on the way home, can you pick up work milk tonight at work? I mean, how many times? Now, here's the thing. Can we give ourselves some grace? Because none of us are perfect people. We're going to mess some stuff up. But how do we model the expectations of other people? Because at the end of the day, here's the thing. Modeling expectations builds trust, doesn't it? I get to coach principals and superintendents all across the country in July of every year when a lot of these folks turn over. Tom, I'm starting in a new building. If you were me, where would you start? My question always back to them is, how do you start to build trust? Because at the end of the day, without it, you have nothing. And isn't trust really the, as we process this, as we think about, isn't trust also the foundation of relationships? I mean, you ever been in a relationship you can't trust the other person? Don't answer that, but process, right? How did it work? It didn't, unless trust was restored. Aren't relationships really the foundation of our culture? So point number three, to stay personal and authentic in the midst of adversity, we also have to model the desired outcomes. If you're in a leadership position, modeling what we expect from our teachers, we're that superintendent modeling what we expect for our staff members is absolutely vital in this work. As I wrap up just very quickly, last couple of minutes here, 
We're going to talk about staying personal and authentic in the midst of adversity. It's grounded in relationships. For those of us in the K-12 space, our work is about loving and caring about kids. Everything else we do is secondary to that. We know that. We talked about that. But I know sometimes when I start pointing the finger this way, as opposed to pointing the finger and using words like we, our, and they, as opposed to like me, my, and I, start to process this work is really about other people. Do me a favor, if you would, put your cell phone back out real quick. It was only 15 minutes ago that I asked you to send a text message to somebody else you love and care about. If you already got a response back from the person, I'm hoping there's at least a few, otherwise this failed miserably in 15 minutes. Can you wave your phone there? Anybody already get a response back? Look at that. A couple of us do. You know why I shared that? We literally took 30 seconds. I only had 20 minutes. I gave you 30 seconds back to simply reach out to somebody you loved and cared about just to make that connection, those interactions, because every one of those interactions really does matter. And literally almost half the people in 15 minutes, you have no idea the hidden stories on that person's heart today. You have no idea what was going on in their mind. Maybe they're having a great day. And they look at yours, and all of a sudden their day was that much better. It didn't cost us anything either. So I ask you as you process this with the adversity all around us, who's that person on your team that could use an extra 30 seconds of your time? Who's that extra person, that student that you work with that could use an extra couple minutes of your time when you get back from this conference to have that one-on-one, -on -one, to build that trust, to build that relationship? Because the hidden stories matter, the relationship matters, the trust matters every single time. See, at the end of the day, when we become more concerned about what we teach, which is important, but when we become more concerned about what we teach than who we teach, we've totally lost the purpose and why we do what we do and the work that we do each day. As a dad and not as an educator, as a dad, I plead with you, teach hard, lead hard, give them your all. And my friends love them harder. In the middle of a pandemic, it's especially what they need. Of course, it's important all the time in the work that we do. You see, your story and your great school and your great district, it's not finished yet. Go get it. Thanks for hanging out with me for 20 minutes. I appreciate y'all. Thanks for being here. Yeah.